you've actually plateaued as a support player, so to speak, or a tank player. But say you're playing a DPS hero and you win every single exchange. That means you most likely have not plateaued and you should just pick Tracer and go win every single exchange and then go win the game. Because if you win every single exchange, you'll just kill all the enemy heroes and then your team can push regardless. If you cannot do that, then you have then you have plateaued and there are people on the other team that are at equivalent skill levels as you. And that is where you need to become self-critical and start thinking about what you might be doing wrong or what you could change about your own play. It's important to remember that you need to be self-critical because being critical of your teammates doesn't help you improve as a player. Yes, maybe your team doesn't benefit from the May as walling people often spawn, but that doesn't help you become better as a player. And that's what your goal is to be, is you want to be the best player you can be. You don't want your teammates to be the best players they can be. And going along with that is gold medals, because a lot of I hear this a lot in games. People say, I have the gold medals. This isn't my problem. I'm doing my job. And that can be true, but it's not necessarily true. And that's not a mentality you want to have when you're in a game. Sitting in the game and saying, I don't need to change what I'm doing, even if my team's losing, because I have gold medals, or what everyone else is doing is wrong, isn't going to help you get better as a player. That's just it. That's just saying that you're doing your job and you want everyone else to pick up any slack that might be happening, which even if it is true, you should change how you're playing to fit with your team because you are, you should be the best player on your team. You want to be the bigger player. You want to be making the changes. You should be the playmaker, not the rest of your team. And along with that goes that last bullet point, expecting more from yourself than your teammates. You need to expect yourself to be the best player you can be, and you need to be self-critical and make sure that you know that you can change things and that you can become a better player. Because if you don't do any of these things, you won't become a better player yourself. Okay, so on to good hero picks and bad hero picks. This is entirely for solo queue. Uh, before anyone yells at me about the bad heroes, because your favorite hero might be over there, I'm looking at people that might be playing D.Va or possibly Junkrat. Um, D.Va's I will, Yes, I will explain those in a little bit. You'll notice there's asterisks on the good hero list. McCree, Genji, Hanzo. McCree and, and Hanzo specifically pick those heroes. They're good heroes if you have good aim. They are not good heroes if you can't aim. If you don't hit your shots, those, those heroes are not good. They are useless. And they revolve entirely around that, and you should avoid playing them until you have somewhere around 30% accuracy and about 10% of those shots that you hit are headshots. That, is, should, that should be what you're aiming for. Ideally, at high-level play, you get around 50% accuracy, not including shooting Reinhardt's shield aimlessly. And that should be about what you aim for if you're uh, scaling at anywhere above 3,500. Genji, I also listed there. Uh, someone said, does it mean that if you, as a DPS, and you're not getting the medals, you're essentially letting your teammates down? Uh, partially, as a DPS, you should have some medals. There shouldn't. There's uh, three medals, and you your team will generally have two DPS, two tanks. If both the tanks and one of the DPS are out damaging you, you're probably not doing the work. But at the same time, you should measure it based on how much work is being done as a team. If the team itself is stomping the other team, then the rest of your teammates may just be getting to the fight or doing things faster than you're able to do them, which may just be an indication that they're not in as good of a skill bracket. If your team is getting destroyed and you do not have any medals as a DPS, that is probably indicative of a, of a problem. But you shouldn't base everything just on medals. <sighs> OK. Um, on to the bad hero list. I figured most of these, uh, most of the good heroes should be self-explanatory. I will touch on the some of the individual heroes in my individual hero section. That should be coming up. So Junkrat, May, Diva, and Symmetra. People are probably looking at those. Along with Lucio and Reinhardt, I'll touch on I'll touch on Reinhardt in the bad hero section or in the individual hero section. But Lucio for solo queue is not a good uh, pick just because of his impact in the game. You pick Lucio because of his speed boost, but unless your team is entirely disorganized, there is not much of a benefit to playing a Lucio because there are other healers that are that can heal quite a lot more than Lucio can, and unless you're on King of the Hill, he doesn't have as big of a game impact. And if you're playing solo queue, you want to avoid being forced into playing those roles, which generally means picking third or fourth on your team. 
as for Junkrat, May, Diva, and Symmetra, Junkrat and May are very situational picks. I'll touch on them in the individual hero section as well, but you shouldn't be picking them and not knowing what you're doing. So if you pick, if your mentality when you're picking them is, I think this might be a good pick, you probably don't know what you're doing and you should not pick them and you should pick something else. As for Diva, Diva is just, she's kind of like a sad case. Sorry is huge meta right now and she completely counters Diva. Your tanks need to be an anchor for your team. They allow your team to stay in one place. And if the other team's off tank Sorry can force you to flee the, flee the battle, then you are giving up free ground just because you are playing D.Va, which is why she's a bad pick in general. So if the other team doesn't have a Zarya, you can play D.Va. That's fine. She is good on some maps, such as Numbani, where there's high ground that you can take advantage of. But in general, she's just not a good pick. And Symmetra, I always, I don't always like her as a pick just because there's a lot of backlash from your teammates. And when you're playing and competitive with other people that you don't know, keeping the peace is a very important thing to do because it allows people to, it allows your team to maintain a calm mentality while they're playing, which is very important. Yeah. Uh, no, the, I just threw them out there when I, when, as I was thinking about it. I know some heroes I don't believe are listed on here. Uh, some of the other bad heroes, Reinhardt, I'll touch on later. Widowmaker, Bastion, and Torbjorn. Those should be pretty self-explanatory. Widowmaker is just the worst version of Hanzo at this point. Uh, Bastion and Torbjorn are too easily countered. Yeah. What if I don't know what else to pick? You said about Junkrat and May. Like you said, you probably, you probably don't know what you're doing. You're pick, but you'd like to be really sure. Um, generally, Junkrat and May have other options around them. May is a very niche pick. Uh, Junkrat himself is just a high DPS damage dealer with a somewhat decent mobility. Uh, Soldier and Fair are usually good alternatives to him. If the other team has a very good McCree, you could always, you can always just pick Soldier. If those options are all taken, if all the DPS options are taken, your team probably doesn't need another DPS. Um, as for May, May is good on first choke points. And again, I'll touch on these heroes later in the individual hero section. But you need to know what you're doing with May to run her well and run her with your team. Okay, so queuing with friends. This is a, uh, Overwatch is a very social game, and a lot of times you'll want to queue with your friends in competitive because it's fun, and that's great and all. But there's some things you need to avoid doing if you're queuing with your friends as a social interaction. Because when you queue with your friends as a social interaction, you may notice that you communicate with each other but you're not always communicating to the fullest extent. And if you notice that, you'll see the second bullet point here, don't six stack and don't five stack. If you six stack and five stack, you will play against other six stacks and five stacks. And there are a lot of teams out there that are in all the skill brackets that six stack and are very serious and they communicate a lot. And if you're playing with a six stack of friends that is not communicating as much as these other teams are, then you are just putting yourself at a disadvantage. Duo, duo queue and tri queuing is usually the best because you can minimize the amount of randoms on your team that may or may not be good regardless of them. And you can always run combos together and you can communicate well with two or three people. A lot of times I see people communicating well with maybe one or one or two people that they know, but when you get six people and everyone starts yelling, you just forget about who to pay attention to. And a lot of times people get zoned out. Another thing to pay attention to is playing combos. If you and your friend both want to queue together and you both play the same position, you are both throwing your, the rest of your team under the bus if any of them play DP, play the same position as you. Say both you and your friend play support and you get queued with, you queue together and you queue up with another support player. That player is now forced to play any other position just because both of you are playing support. And if he doesn't know what to do, and then you're just putting your team at a disadvantage. It's really good to play combos with your team or with your stack. Like say you have a tank main and a support main and you two queue together, you can play a Reinhardt Anna and allow the rest of your team that may play support and tank to also play a support or an off tank or something related while also being able to communicate ults that could, ult combos that could change the game or the pace of the game 
and still having that communication with yourself and not uh, throwing the rest of your team under the bus in that sense. Okay, manners, momentum, and how to win, basically. So manners, it should be pretty obvious what you should do, although some people know and don't do it. Don't flame, blame, or tilt. Tilting, if you tilt, you're just putting yourself at a lower chance of winning the game. When you tilt, you start playing worse, and you just don't want – you just avoid it, basically. Flaming and blaming, they may be – they may seem like they're either necessary or it's uh, – or it might be, actually, I'm missing, I'm missing a word here. Or, or you might feel like it might be necessary, but just don't do it. If you can keep your teammates uh, calm and generally under a good mentality, you'll be able to work better with them. You don't, I remember a particular game I played with some friends, and we had a May on our team, and we said some mean things to the May after losing one round of Nepal after we had won the first two. And then she proceeded to wall us off and spawn for the rest of the game. As th these are things you want to avoid. We probably could have won that game, but we didn't because we decided to start flaming and blaming people. They might not deserve to be where they're at. They might be really bad. Just encourage them and at worst, just mute people and ignore them. That's what I usually do. And then and on to how to win. Momentum is the easiest way to win a game. You'll see here on King's Row, I've put two pictures down here. There's the first point and the arch. Basically what momentum is, if you don't already know, excuse me, um, it's basically where your team gets a foothold in the game and you have captured an objective or you've accomplished one thing and you want to keep that going because your team is winning. So say your team pushes onto the first point at A and you take that point and the other team is staggered and spawns basically staggered being they are respawning at different times because they died different times during the team fight some of some of them have the backward spawn some of them have the forward spawn your job as your own player knowing this and knowing that you need to keep your momentum is you should leave a few people on the point and then push the rest of your team or everyone you can up over to alley the forward spawns will spawn and a lot of the times they'll come straight into the alley these people are easy pickings for you to take and then and you you and the rest of your team need to converge on these people and kill them and have them get the backward spawn because their backward spawns will be coming into the fight around the time they're dying and then you will be in a one-up situation with more with more firepower and you will be easily able to roll, roll your team through street space this is a very, a very important thing to know on all hybrid maps with a street phase and pretty much any map that has a first control point that you have to capture or any other. Actually, it's pretty much any map, although you have to look for the forward spawns. Um, I can go over where the forward spawns are later, but I got all of these map uh, locations from map callouts on Google. You can look them up. Okay. Uh, managing ultimate and when to push. So let's say you were keeping the momentum and then your team is pushing forward and then you all die. And then you all come back and you all group up. You need to know when to push and when not to push. Because if you push into another team that has all of their ultimates and you have none of your ultimates, you will get wiped. And if they're playing smart and they only use a few ultimates, they can continue to do this throughout the game and you will just lose every single push and then you won't be able to break the defenses. So you need to keep track of the other team's ultimate charge. I know in competitive, I don't believe the kill cams are enabled, so you won't be able to see it from there, but basically keeping a good eye on how when the last time they used their ult, you can check the timer to see. It usually takes uh, DPS here is about a minute to build their ult, sometimes a little bit faster. And just check. Usually what I do is as a as a main of one of one particular area, you check your particular area area complement on the other team for their ult. So if you're playing Reaper, you need to keep track of their Reaper and know when he has his ult. And you also need to keep track of their positions to see when they're looking for him. It's usually pretty easy to tell if Reaper teleports to the top of the arch at Temple of Anubis. He's probably wanting to drop down and press Q and then teabag you guys. So... Keep track of sort of things like that so you can avoid them and know where to push. 
And another thing is if you're in the middle of a push and another team use their ult uses their ultimates and they start and they get key picks on your team, don't continue to use your ultimates in that fight. You're wasting them because you already lost the fight if you lost your key picks, if they, if they got key picks. So make sure that you guys use your ults together. Don't just drop them whenever you see stuff going down. Make sure you know that the fight is winning. And I'll also touch on this later in the high-level play, what, what ultimates you should and shouldn't be using together. And another thing, choke points. So this game is basically revolves around choke points. There's choke points in every single map. You need to get through those choke points quickly. That means if you're playing heroes that can help push through the choke point, like Reinhardt and Lucio, you don't just dilly-dally there and look at people. If you're playing Lucio, you speed boost your team through the choke. If you're playing Reinhardt, you hold your shield up long enough to get everyone through, and then you go with your team. You make everyone get through, and then you leave. You don't, during the speed boost, you don't walk back and forth with your shield and then watch as all of your team kind of like runs in front of it. You walk with your team, and you make sure they all get through. And also, if you are the people that are supposed to be getting through, and you see Reinhardt's shield off the choke so that you can all run through, at least you speed boost you. That doesn't mean you keep shooting at the enemy team and you sit in the choke. That means you go through the choke so the rest of your team can get through. It's a team play, and everyone needs to make sure that they are going through the choke at the same time. Okay, individual heroes. I'll be touching on all of your hate for me about listing your favorite hero on here. <laughs> don't worry about it for all you diva lovers I'll touch on that hopefully she'll get buffed or Zarya will get nerfed I think I'm the only one so I think you're fine okay well I'll still be locking my doors at night <laughs> May this is where May is good I went. I actually went into a custom game to basically show what she does or how to be a complete piece of crap um, on choke points where there is one or very few entries, this is just one of them on Hanamura or also on King's Row, you kind of sit to the side and let their Reinhardt, who is going to push in without his team because he's frustrated that they're not walking forward, push in, and then you wall him off and you gangbang him and make him very sad. And then the rest of the team will be a little bit also sad and they'll just sit there and wait for him to respawn and then they'll do it again. Ideally, if you play against a good team, this won't happen, but this works on pretty much all against all the disorganized teams in competitive. Um, she may is almost only good on the first choke points, and she is the only consistent disabler in the game other than Anna. Disabler being someone that can prevent the other players on the other team from actually doing anything, such as freezing them and then waving hello and shooting you in the face. She has very small damage output, so you are giving up a lot for picking her. Because if you pick her, you're trading out generally another DPS. You don't want to trade out a tanker or support for a May. Which means that your other DPS needs to be very consistent, needs to be good, and he needs to be able to deal damage that you won't be dealing. She is also self-sustaining, so she won't require a healer. And on King of the Hill, she has separate roles on King of the Hill versus the hybrid and the control point maps, the ones I listed here. On King of the Hill, a May, if you are running a May, you would want to run her right next to your supports. Basically prevent her from monkey jumping on top of them and killing them by freezing him and then waving hello and teabagging them as they die. That's usually what you do when you just tilt the enemy team's tank. That's basically what May is. She's sometimes considered an off tank, but you wouldn't want to run her like that. Also, another misconception, misconception is that shooting May's ice wall uh, build turtle. I actually went into a custom game and tested this. It does not. So feel free to buff your stats all you want by shooting it and say that you're better because you have more damage. Junkrat. So I know a lot of people love Junkrat too, and I kind of listed him on the bat here just because I think people play him when he shouldn't be played. He is good for enclosed areas, squishy heroes, and basically is what you would call a bad Pharah. The kind of ideal is that if the other team has a Pharah and you have a Junkrat, your Junkrat will, get, will lose to the Pharah every single fight. What he's good for is keeping an area of the map shut down, such as on the side on Temple of Anubis. In the first choke point, he can keep that area shut down. But after that, once, the, once they push through the choke point, he is inconsistent in what you would say damage output is. Um, he, that's what he's good for. He is very situational. So... You need to know what you're doing when you pick him. 
And you need to know, say you pick him on Temple Anubis, you need to know, I am going to shut down that choke point. I am going to prevent them from pushing through and making space for my team. That is what you need to know when you're doing what you're doing with him. If you pick him and you think, I'll deal damage and shoot Reinhardt's shield, you're probably not helping your team as much as you could be. Okay, Reinhardt. You'll notice there's one little circular bullet point with a bunch of little arrows. It's because Reinhardt is all about communication. I listed him on the bad heroes list just because in solo queue, you're not always going to be able to communicate with your teammates. Ideally, you'd want to, but as we know, you get into a competitive game and you go on the mic and you say, hey, guys, let's get ready to play. And then they say, kill yourself or go away, noob, or something like that. And then they mute, mute their mics and then you become sad. So this is why Reinhardt is a bad hero in the solo queue, because you can't, ideally, if you're amazing, you might be able to carry, but he relies so much around telling your team what to do. And his mechanical skill is minimal because there's only a few buttons you have to press and you just have to know when to press them. But being, but communicating with your team what is happening and what you're doing is the most important part of Reinhardt. I've listed here in the little arrows what you should be doing or what you should be communicating. There's plenty more, but just telling people when your shield is going down, basically saying, my shield's at 500, I'm putting it down, get to safety, is very important. You can't just put your shield down in the middle of nowhere just because you might have to, but if, if the McCree behind you doesn't know that and he gets domed by Widowmaker, that's kind of your fault. And you, have, you need to communicate when you're ulting. Your team should know that they need to start doing cleanup. You can't just ult other people when I... I know that sometimes as Reinhardt, because I'm a main tank, I play Reinhardt as well, that a lot of your ults are situational. The the other Reinhardt fire strikes and you see a good opportunity and you do it. And you won't always be able to communicate when you're ulting, but you should communicate that you're looking for an ult. You should communicate that you have ult and you need to be telling your teammates, I have ult, I'm going to be looking for an opportunity, be ready to do something, be ready to clean up. Ideally, going along with with when your shield is going down, you should be communicating when your shield is at 1,800, 500 health. You should put it down at 500. Never let your shield break it if you don't have to. When You should communicate when you're charging and exchanging. One job of Reinhardt is you need to exchange your charge with the other Reinhardt's charge. If you jump out of the way, there may be a support behind you that's pocketing you that gets domed by their Reinhardt, and then they'll die. And that is your fault. If their Reinhardt charges, you need to charge him and you need to hit together. You'll both take 300 damage and it's up to your team at that point to follow through and make sure that you survive and that you guys win the team fight. You should communicate when a DPS is on you, such as Genji. If Genji is going around and starts hitting you from behind, you cannot turn your shield just to deal with him. You need to tell your teammates that there is a DPS on you, Genji is harassing you, and that they need to deal with it. That is their job. And a lot of Reinhardt is communicating what's going on around you. You should communicate what a corner you're holding, and you should communicate when you're losing shield wars. For example, if the other team's Reinhardt is constantly getting his ult and he keeps hammering you down because the other team keeps breaking your shield, you need to communicate that you guys either need to push in a different way or that you guys, as a team, need to start focusing the other Reinhardt shield more. Because if you lose every shield war, that's not necessarily your fault, but your team needs to know about it. And they need to know that is why they keep getting knocked down and stunned and their team gets wiped. Uh, there's plenty more to uh, know about Reinhardt. If you really, there's a ton of things that to communicate and I can't fit it all in one slide. If you want to know more, you can uh, ask me if you're a Reinhardt main. Um, there's just a huge list of things and I can't go over all of it. Anna. So basically Anna is one of the best healers in the game. She has... She's basically the best support in the game as of right now because of her ability to shut down other healers, her ability to do damage and get picks without a lot of actual DPS, and her ability to basically just wipe teams with her ult. So who you, who you should be ulting? Right now, it is a tank meta. That means you should be ulting tanks. Ideally, Reinhardt. Roadhog with his ult. Don't ult Daria. Because even if she has high charge, yeah, she can do a lot of damage, but it's not, it doesn't work very well. And there's plenty of other good ult targets. Currently, there's a meta with Reaper and his little windmill hurricane where you ult him and he just kind of kills everybody. Your wife, your children, your family, and everyone else. <laughs> um, you can do that a lot. They're, the ult targets are just like, everything situational. You need to be able to pick and choose. Pocketing. 
And that's another thing. So pocketing is basically where if you've played TF2, you probably know what it means. But you pick a target and you start shooting them and you make sure they're at full health. They're your top priority. You'll heal other people, ideally, when they come to you and you might prioritize low health targets. But you need to make sure that the person you are pocketing, such as a Reinhardt, is your top priority. You give them everything you have, your heal grenade, and pretty much you just stick your gun up their butt. Okay, so who to heal, that kind of goes along with pocketing. You should be targeting people that are in danger, first of all. Anyone that is at low health needs heals immediately because you are good at picking out people from far away. Anyone that needs a heal that might not be able to get it right away or people that are in the middle of a fight, you want to heal them as well. And then after that, the heal priority should go to your tanks because they need to be kept alive so they can tank for your team as well as your DPS. Ideally, heal priority completely is based on who has the most health at the time, but you'll want to, you will want to heal your tanks a lot because they also give you the most ult and it builds your ult very quickly and you should have your ult at every team fight and healing your tanks is the quickest way to get that. And using your heal grenade, that is one of Anna's best abilities. Actually, all of her abilities are amazing, but your heal grenade basically allows you to either keep people alive in a team fight or to prevent other the other team from healing in a team fight. If Zarya Graviton surges, she should not be afraid to do that just because the other team has the Senyata. You should be there with your Zarya ready to chuck your grenade on her Graviton and just wipe their team and make their Senyata very sad. So what I see a lot of Anna's doing is you use your grenade as your self-heal. It is your self-heal, but it should only be used when you are about to die because a flanker is on you or someone is trying to get at you. On yourself anyways. Otherwise, you'll be always using your grenade on your teammates because it's very impactful and it has a long cooldown, somewhere around 12 seconds. And you don't want to just waste that because you don't want to walk 10 feet to get a health back. <clears throat> okay, Diva and Zarya. So this is where the one person who hates me. I'll be talking about Zarya. When to pick Diva? She is good when the other team doesn't have Zarya basically, because Zarya forces, Zarya as an off tank forces your D.Va, one of your anchors of your team, to basically leave the fight or lose her mech. That is something you cannot have. D.Va is very good at dealing with projectiles and reapers occasionally. Some, pretty much any hero that does high damage with bullets or any sort of projectile. And she can't deal with beams, so she basically can't deal with Mei, Zarya, or... Symmetra, pretty much a large host of heroes that you don't want to have that weakness to. Your tanks on your team need to be an anchor, and they need to be able to stay in one place and fight anyone. And you can't have that with D.Va, which is why you basically just can't pick D.Va if the other team has any of those heroes, which are on, which are in almost every team composition, which is why you basically can't pick D.Va. Dealing with Zarya as a D.Va is you run away, and that is what I'm talking about right here, is that you can't have that you can't just run away from every team fight but you're forced to when you're dealing with Zarya which is why you can't pick D.Va but assuming you pick D.Va or Zarya there is a lot of things that you need to know about them I'll I can go into Zarya in more depth later at some time because she is a very complex hero in terms of what you can and can't do but the major things that I see people not doing when they play this hero are tanking for your teammates and using your bubbles for your teammates, even your self level. Say you have a Reaper that's trying to get out and he his Wraith form is going off cooldown and you bubble him, but that bubble isn't going to be enough. You should step in front of him and bubble. And that's basically what tanking for your teammates is, is you step in front of them and use your own self as a tank. And it sounds kind of, it sounds kind of intuitive as something you would do, but you wouldn't believe the amount of people you see not doing this because they use their bubble for a teammate on them they see it break and then they see the teammate die and they think well i guess i couldn't have done anything in that situation you need to use your body as a tank zarya has 200 health and shields you should abuse it you can go into a fight and take a little bit of damage and let them start shooting you and then use your bubble that's the easiest way to get charged is to bait them into shooting you and thinking that you don't have your bubble off cooldown you need to be communicating when you don't have your bubble as zarya or when you don't have both your bubbles as zarya that way your teammates can know not to do anything stupid, like jump into their entire team. And you should be making sure that you are communicating your ultimate charge as Zarya, because 
Zarya's ult is only as useful as the rest of her team has their ults. You can combo it with Tracer, which is amazing, especially against Senyata. And you can combo it with Reaper ult, you can combo it with Pharah ult. You just need to make sure that your team knows when you have ult, and you need to be constantly asking them when they have their ults. Okay, so the last part of this presentation is high-level play. I'm going to go only a little bit into it because there's a lot of things. But basically, I kind of want to touch on communicating, uh, working with your combo and what combos are in general, calling focus targets, and dive comp, which is one of the few uh, compositions, as well as a little bit on how to work with people. But I'm not as much of a people person, so you guys probably know better than me. So having a plan and focusing on targets. When you go into a game at high-level play, I'm talking particularly to the TESPA team here, you need to you know what you're going to do before it happens. And you need, need, need you need to be able to know this quickly, which means your shot caller, whoever they are, needs to be able to draft a plan and come up with a plan to push after your team gets wiped in say 15 seconds minimum. So basically you can always talk with your team about what to do, but you need to you need to choose and pick and say what is going to happen in a very small time frame. And that is very important. Because if you don't know what your team's going to do, your team's not going to do anything. And if your team doesn't do anything, then you're going to lose. Okay, so the biggest part of that is under making sure that everyone understands their job in the push. You can have a plan, but if no one else knows what the plan is, then nothing's going to get done. If you make sure you can communicate to everyone what their job is as a team player beforehand, before the game say, then they'll know ideally what they'll have to do. And then if you make and then if you communicate again in game, say your specific plan, what is going to happen, then you can you can execute your plan very quickly, very efficiently. And that is what you want your team to be able to do. Is you want to have six people that can work together quickly and efficiently and get things done. That includes not overkill. What overkill is, is when you use, say, all of your ults in one team fight and you blow them all away and you kill the other team, you get a team kill. That's great. You probably didn't need to use all six of your ultimates. That's basically overkill. Is you need to make sure you know what com what combos you're going to use, and I'll touch on combos as well in the next few slides. But you need to do that as well as calling out focus targets, high priority targets, usually Zenyatta's, um, Anna's, making sure that they are down during the push is very important, and you need to call it so that everyone knows who they should be going on and what they should be doing. Because if everyone is running around aimlessly, you could win, but you probably won't. And having team fights where people are running around just TDMing is basically, you might as well play Call of Duty because there's no point. And along with that goes being aware of enemy positions and what you are doing. You need to make sure that you are aware of where you are and that you are in a position to be able to communicate what's going on and what you're going to do and know that you are able to do what you're supposed to do in that team fight. If you are playing Reaper and you're sitting at their spawn, you're not in a position to do what you're supposed to do in your team fight, and you need to move. Um, sorry if I'm kind of skipping over comments. I'm not exactly looking at the chat right now. Yeah. Um, so combos. Basically, combos are two-person sets that synergize extremely well. These are things such as Azaria ult, along with a Tracer, or a Reinhardt and a McCree. That's a very common combo. Um, Zarya and Reaper, Reinhardt and Reaper, Zarya and Roadhog, Zarya and Hanzo. These are all basically just combos that you can use to wipe an enemy team and not have to use more ults. So the idea is, is that you and the other person on your team that plays that hero should always be communicating. I know when I'm playing, I'm always talking with my McCree and saying, McCree, what's your ultimate charge? I have my ult, or I'm at 80% ult. How close are you to your ult? And you need to communicate that you, when you're getting ready, when you're in position, and how to do that. You guys should always be talking. You should obviously always be communicating with everyone on your team, but the two of you, or the two people that you combo with, there could be more people on your team that you also combo with, should always be communicating with each other personally on like a more on your own level about what's going on because you two are a set of people on the team that you need to make sure that everything goes right. And combos are what you would use in a team fight. Say you go into a push and you say, we're going to use the Reinhardt McCree. That means that you guys can communicate together 
and get the team white for them and you don't have to go you do overkill everyone else knows that they're they don't have to ult and you can go from there basically a lot can come from this say you've got your reinhardt mccree and mccree says he doesn't have his ult but he has his flashbang and reinhardt says he has his ult his ult then what you can do is you can have say lucio speed boost mccree up flashbang the other reinhardt shield and just hammer them down that's an easy way to get a team kill and it all comes from just being a combo and working together with each other if you didn't do any of that then that might not have happened and your team would be stuck sitting against the other team in the choke point exchanging and that's what you want to avoid is that you should always have a combo ready to go with your team fight and be alternating them so that you can keep wiping the enemy team and keep your momentum up. Dive comp and supports and their role in competitive. Basically, basically what dive comp is, is most of you probably already know, but you have a composition that is going to dive, hence the name, the enemy team and take out their supports. This usually would consist of something like a Winston, a Reap, not a Reaper, a Genji, a Tracer, and your idea is you get towards the enemy team, you avoid them as much as possible until you're ready to jump on them, and you'll just hop on them, and you kill their supports off. That's the idea. Once you kill their supports off, you can then you can then follow through and just wipe the rest of their team because they don't have any heals, and it's it's one of these things that you need to watch out for as you're playing, is if you're playing... On defense, say, you need to recognize the other team's picks and say they're playing dive comp and group together and stay careful. There's easy ways to counter dive comp. That's things like May, Reaper, Zenyatta, uh, Lucio. Lucio is very hard to pin down because he's so mobile. He can get out of the way of a dive comp. Zenyatta does a lot of damage with her with his Discord. And if you have a May or a Reaper babysitting your... Um, babysitting your supports then it will make it almost impossible for any dive comp to jump on them and take them out without either focusing you first and then dying or focusing their support your supports and then they die and when should you run dive comp you ideally don't want to run dive comp if it if you run it several times and it fails if you run it several times and it fails then you um so to speak it's not working and you need to switch uh, you usually run it at the start of a match to get a one-up on a team. You can surprise them and just jump them, get the first point really easily, and then you might switch off of it. It's good for keep, it's good for getting momentum in the start of the game. It's not so great at keeping the momentum because once the other team realizes what's going on, they'll probably switch to counters, which means that once you get your dive comp work, working and it happens once or twice, you'll probably want to switch off. And then working with your team. Um, I can't say the most about this since I'm not the best team player myself. I don't have the greatest social skills, but you should be able to, as a team, stay calm and identify problems in game and have solutions calmly and in a civil manner without doing things like smashing your keyboard or calling people mean names or anything like that. Don't fight. If you have a problem with another teammate, you can bring it up after the game. Not during the game, after the game. Bringing up things during the game doesn't help anyone. It doesn't fix anything. People will just be angry when they play, and they probably won't play better. Uh, you'll see in the upper right corner with that gif, that is Puppy, a professional Dota player, smashing his keyboard or his, uh, his computer monitor. That's basically what you want to not be doing. Um, this is some shameless self-promotion. <laughs> if you want to add me, my name is Burger. Uh, my battle tags Burgers number one three one four. Steam and Burgers trademark. You can follow me on Twitch. I will be streaming the DreamHack o- DreamHack Open qualifiers tomorrow at about six, as well as there is a tournament tonight. But there is the test for team, so I'm not going to tell you when that is. Um, feel free to ask me any questions now. There's like an open Q and A. I have plenty of time. It would seem about fifteen to thirty minutes until I have to run off. So. Uh, Go for it. So, when is a good time to pick Roadhog instead of Zarya? Like, as like your main off tank. Roadhog instead of Zarya as your main off tank. A lot of comps with Roadhog, at least in high-level play, will actually run three tanks, because Roadhog 
as a tank isn't exactly the best tank. He's very self-sustaining, and that doesn't help your your supports build their ultimate charge. Your supports want to build their ultimate charge because they are some of the best ultimates in the game. Uh, Anna's nano boost is very good. Uh, Lucio ult can save a team's and Yacht ult's very important. And as a Roadhog, you are not helping your team get that ultimate charge at all. Uh, you can use his ult very defensively, but it still doesn't help a lot. Because he has such a high damage output, he actually has the highest damage output for uh, Reinhardt's shield because of his right click at short at about the medium standard engage range against Reinhardt will do anywhere between 300 to 500 damage to his shield and you can take it down in for in a usually about five to ten clicks or so you can run him along with a Zarya and a Reinhardt and you can win all the shield wars and just be getting picks for your team you would run him when you're having trouble breaking a defense or breaking down a Reinhardt shield because you can re prevent their Reinhardt from keeping uh, from keeping his shield up a lot and you can take out anyone that gets even remotely out of position or you can just drag people out of position when Reinhardt puts his shield down. You can also take advantage of miscommunication if you think the Reinhardt on their team isn't communicating with their team. And then you can just pound his shield and just wait for him to drop it and just hook someone through it. Um, you usually don't want to run him just as a, as a solo off tank. Zarya is something that you'd want to run in pretty much every team composition because she's so good right now. So, another question for you, Mr. Nerd down here, so from the top to the bottom. The first one we got was... Uh, why burgers? Um, I like burgers. It's actually burgers trademark, but uh, Battle.net doesn't let me put a trademark in my name, so I'm stuck with just burgers. Uh, Carrot says, what do you think? What, yeah, what do you think about the triple tank and triple healer? It's, um, the composition itself is good for pushing a first objective. It revolves entirely around Anna getting her ult very early in the game. You usually run a Winston, Reinhardt, Zarya, along with an Anna, Zenyatta, Lucio. And the idea behind it is that you just rush the enemy team. Anna can get her ult extremely quickly while keeping your tanks alive and you can just beat down the enemy team before their respawns have time to catch up. And it works out very well in a sense, but your Ana needs to know exactly what she's doing and exactly what she needs to do. And you need to make sure you call focus targets with Zenyatta because if you don't do that, you can end up just feeding ultimate charge with your big tanky heroes taking, taking a lot of hits and you can end up failing for a good long while because if your first push fails, the other team will have a lot more ultimate charge than they normally would against the first push, and then they can continue to set up their combos and start wiping your team's route if you try and change. So it's very good, but you need to know exactly what you're doing and when to do it and how to run it. She's at, or she asks, when to pick Winston? When to pick Winston. I always run Winston on King of the Hill just because he's so mobile. Reinhardt on King of the Hill is a niche pick, so to speak. You wouldn't run, want to run Winston on payload maps, etc., all the time unless it works very well against the other team's composition. It's mostly because Winston is so easily countered by Reaper, and you are forced to play very passively if the other Reaper is sitting around their team's squishies. You can't play against that, so to speak, as Winston. You have to have a team play against that. So running him on pretty much King of the Hill, Dive Comp, or... Um, the 3-3 three, three composition is usually when you'd run him. Uh, the next one is from OJ. Uh, should you use Junkrat's traps to reactivate just plant, or just plant them? Um, if by Junkrat's traps, I assume you're meaning not the concussion mine, or do you mean both the concussion mine and the trap? Just the trap. Just the trap. Uh, the trap itself is very good for catching off flankers, but it only works in very small enclosed areas if you know the person's going to go there. Sometimes what I do is, because the trap's kind of, it's not exactly consistent, what I like to do is I like to just throw it in a place where no one would ever be, and it really tilts flankers if they get to that place, and they get trapped in it, and they become very angry because they think, why would this ever be there? But a lot of times, if you want the most consistent use out of it, you'll put it at a choke point. You need to make sure it's in an area where you your opponent can't see it, 
using it reactively is what I would consider inconsistent because your opponent will see it put down and they will, will most likely destroy it or just avoid stepping in it until after the engagement is over. It can be used if the other team is uh, oblivious, I suppose, reactively, but I wouldn't say it's consistent. With the, <laughs> believe it or not, I've put. But uh, obviously, there's currently what I like to consider a nerf to Anna in the PTR. How is that going to change her in the meta? Um, she'll still build her ult extremely fast, just because of how fast she heals. But the nerf itself will probably, the three-three composition isn't being run very much anymore. Um, I doubt it will be run anymore, if at all, along with this nerf. But she is still one of the best healers in the game, and that with that allowing her to outheal other healers, assuming you can aim. Um, she is still very strong. Her ultimate, the 20% is, matters a lot only if you're using it in extended team fights and you're not being taken out or the other team isn't focusing you. Otherwise, you'll still have your ultimate charge every team fight or so, or at least mid team fight, and it shouldn't affect her regular play that much. I think that's really cool. <laughs> How about Pixie has got practicing man? Uh, we are beyond that. That is, uh, we might be getting one more. I have a number. Yeah. Sure. Any tips for flanking? Flanking. Um, make space. A lot of times, one of the easiest way to get through a choke point is if you're flanking and you get behind them, say on Hanamura and your team can't push through the choke point, the more people you can drag away from the choke point to come after you while you stay alive, the more likely it is that your team will see that their Reinhardt and their Anna are kind of all alone and they might walk through and kill them. Obviously, your team doesn't always do that, but being on the flank, the more people you can drag away from the main fight and the more people you can pick off and just harass is usually the best thing to do until you have your ultimate that you can work with with your team. Question is, Mercy or Lucio? Uh, Mercy and Lucio, they kind of have a little bit different rules. Mercy is very applicable when the other team is running combos such as uh, Zarya Hanzo or Zarya Tracer because they're, as a Zenyatta, at least against Zarya Tracer, there's nothing you can do about that because they just instantly die. As a Mercy, if you can avoid getting stuck in the Graviton Surge, you can always come in and just revive your teammates. But along with Mercy Res is one of the facts that your team will only have a good team fight if you get a good res off, which means that everyone needs to know that they need to go on the cart and die as soon as key picks start happening against your team. As for Lucio, he is picked mostly for a speed boost. His healing is a little bit mediocre, Although it's very great for disorganized teams or teams where the uh, people are want heals, but they aren't exactly built around protecting you. Mercy can usually take care of herself if your teammates spread out enough and position themselves correctly. And her pistol also actually does a lot of damage. Um, although I don't re recommend you taking that out all the time. I wouldn't say do that. But um, she can somewhat defend herself, at least so to speak. But I would run Lucio in more disorganized settings, and I would run Mercy when you are seeing your team die as a group together a lot because of combos. Uh, 